So hi, everybody. I'm Avi Savar. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that you guys can hear us and see us. So make sure to adjust your settings appropriately. Uh, also, feel free to ask questions uh, in the Q&A box, uh, in, in the Q&A module. And uh, we're going to hopefully have some time at the end to uh, to get to your questions. So uh, we got a lot, of go lot to go through today. And, and uh, why don't we jump right in? Today is all about snacking, uh, the future of snacking. We've got a lot of data to unpack, no pun intended. Uh, or actually, I should say pun very much intended. I am joined uh, with the very distinguished and esteemed Eric Pierce. It's the Avi and Eric show once again. Uh, very excited to uh, to, to uh, uh, re-engage here on, on uh, this report. I think the last time we talked, um, we were uh, deep in quarantine and, you know, getting underway. Uh, so hopefully, you know, the light is at the end of the tunnel here. And uh, we're going to talk about where, where the world goes once we open up. Uh, so... Welcome, Eric. Hey, thanks, Avi. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us here today. I'm, I'm delighted that you've chosen to, to spend some time exploring the future of snacking with, with Avi and I. I. I very much appreciate our, our partnership and think we've got some really great content for you today. Um, my team and I at New Hope uh, see it really as our role to help drive responsible growth in the natural and organic products industry. Um, just a, a little background on us. But really more importantly, I think is, is our passion, right? You know, we, we really think that data and insights can help us as an industry build a more responsible, uh, help to scale the business, help to scale the industry, if you will, in a, in a, in a really responsible way. And we hope that we can use uh, marketplace, the marketplace voice to create uh, in, decision making across the industry that again helps us build a an industry capable of bringing more health to more people and hopefully improving uh, climate and, and all those other great things that we champion here in the natural products industry. So we'll bring a little bit of that lens to our, our analysis of snacking today. Um, Avi, why don't you tell us a little bit more and we'll get into the data. Awesome. Uh, so really appreciate it. Uh, you know, New Hope and Susie have been partners now for, for quite some time. And, and I think it's led to, you know, a, a lot of really great insight and some really great content. We're, we're excited to kind of continue that today. Um, a little bit about Suzy. We're a real time uh, market research platform. We work with some of the biggest brands in the world, helping to drive you know, data driven decisions through a uh, real time panel of always on consumers. Um, and today's uh, study uh, is is you know built on the back of, of uh, uh, some research we conducted um, through the platform as well as additional research that we're going to pull in to to, to shape a, a, a really powerful narrative. I think um, you know we talked to a, a thousand consumers uh, in the United States, um, census weighted across age, gender ethnicity and region uh, and you're going to see some additional data sets pulled in uh, as as we go through um, so kind of jumping in uh, you know I think uh, one thing that is abundantly clear here is that everybody snacks right it's a ubiquitous behavior 97 percent of the people we talked to said you know they report snacking on a regular basis you know weekly if not daily and I think um, outside of you know sleeping, you know, and pooping, we probably do nothing else 100% of the time. Uh, and so, you know, it's almost like the dial tone of our lives. Uh, and I think it's really interesting uh, to start to think about coming out of the pandemic, going into the pandemic, what are the behavior shifts and changes um, that we're seeing? Because snacking has always been around uh, and will always be around. But, you know, what is it that's different and what have we learned and where are we going is is really the purpose of, uh, of today's uh, webinar. You know, snacking may be the most normal American behavior there is, right? You know, baseball may be the national pastime, but, you know, we're not playing and watching baseball every single day um, and, and not even every single week. So by definition, snacking is the thing that we do in between meals. Um, and, you know, historically we do our eating at mealtime, but the reality is the connected uh, behavior between mealtimes and, 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 and the occasions that connect us to snacking is a little bit of what we're going to unpack here. Um, and the reality is it's very normal behavior, right? I kind of said it's like dial tone. And as we think about, you know, how things have shifted, um, we're going to walk through kind of a little bit of those behavioral norms and how they've, how they've evolved uh, in the last year. Uh, last year was anything but normal, right? Like, it, you know, if, if, if snacking is a constant behavior, 
Last year was anything but normal, and uh, and we're coming out of it very different people to some degree. You know, if you look at um, you know the acceleration that has happened in the last year, you know, McKinsey has said that you know it's you know the adoption of digital technologies accelerated by almost a decade. Um, you know, it's it's accelerated consumer shopping online. It's normalized uh, video conferencing and working from home. The adoption of virtual healthcare. Right. Uh, you know how how we've now the, the mainstream behavior of being pro, more proactive about our health management, the behaviors around our health and healthier eating habits. All of those things have been accelerated as a result of this pandemic. So big question that we're going to talk about today is, is can you know, is pa pandemic induced behavior? You know, is that going to foreshadow anything for us to learn from? And, and you know, many of us over the last year have been searching for answers. Uh, and our goal today is to, you know, try to answer a few of those of those questions that you might have and see if we can't learn a few things going into, you know, uh, this next year, uh, which will certainly be, you know, one for the record books as, as the world opens up again. Um, so we're going to start with kind of setting a baseline, right? Um, you know, we're going to we're going to uh, talk a little bit about kind of what the baseline is and build on top of that. So, you know, once once we kind of level set, um, we'll talk a little bit about the trends that, that, that began to emerge as part of the pandemic and then unpack insights so that we can get a glimpse into what the future holds for us. Um, so jumping in, you know, the first, uh, you know, the first is, is setting the baseline. So, you know, Eric, uh, you know, why don't you set the baseline for us uh, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll kick things off. It's like almost like, a, you know, give me a, give me a beat, y'all. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Don't ask for me for a beat though. I'm the least rhythmic person in the world. Um, but I can set a baseline with data. That's what I can do. Um, so let's do just that. Uh, what did snacking look like prior to the pandemic? That's the question. That's the baseline we're looking for. A couple of quick talking points. You know, the majority of respondents uh, in our survey typically buy groceries from mass market retail chains and grocery store chains. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, this is uh, the sample was a national representative samples. So um, we're looking at sort of the biggest, broadest audiences where places where people were shopping. Um, and the same goes for the on the go snacking that people were doing in a pre pandemic world. They were primarily buying those things through these channels, Walmart and grocery stores. Um, and these mass market retail chains were the, the primary places where people were buying on the go snacks. Um, and pre-pandemic snacking was overwhelmingly salty and sweet. The majority of consumers tell us that their favorite snacks are just that, they're salty and they're sweet snacks. But it's important as well um, to, to, that we, to recognize that we see snackers are, are more dynamic than that. Uh, on average, snackers picked three different types of snacks meaning as favorites. So meaning that people, yeah, they're eating salty snacks and sweet snacks, but they're also bringing in some of these other things. They might be eating salty snacks and fresh ones, sweet ones and healthy ones. They might be incorporating functional, savory, frozen and natural snacks into their snacking habits as well. People are snacking in a variety of different ways with a variety of different types of goals. Uh, while there are some clear winners um, in the in the data, you know what we do see as well that snacking is complex and situation specific. The interplay between snacking types, need states, and emotions is important uh, as we think about snacking. We ask snackers, however, you know one cool point here is to kind of keep something clear in mind is we ask snackers what was most important to them in choosing a snack pre-pandemic. Deliciousness won out as the top priority among 66% of snackers when deciding how to choose and what kind of chat snacks they were choosing. But of course, other factors are important as well. We know that when consumers are time challenged, that we seek convenience snacking options, and that takes precedence. But we also know as well that emotion plays into this. And when you're trying to avoid snack guilt, folks are often turning to healthier alternatives as well. Pre-pandemic, we knew that the majority of snacking occasions were things like snacking while watching TV and at work, either at home or in the office, and when hanging out with others. I'm um, going to pass this back to Avi a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of snacking with others in a pre-pandemic world. Maybe still on mute. Avi, you know, I, I got you again. Yeah, yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> um, try, trying to trying to be quiet, make sure the dog doesn't bark in the background. 
Um, you, you know, I think I think we, we all craved and, and yearned for a little connectivity and connection here. And I think that was part part of this trend uh that 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 we saw with like this idea of sharing and 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 um connecting with others around food uh and that kind of took us into you know new behaviors as we said right so if i take a pause here um and and think about kind of what's the brand opportunity um you know the reality is one of the hardest things about winning adoption and trial for new brands and new products is kind of breaking an existing uh behavior or habit Right. We're often kind of on autopilot mode when we're when we're making decisions in a grocery store. And I think the pandemic brought to surface, you know, new things that we wanted to do, new things we wanted to try um, connections with our, our close family that we were quarantining with, that, that we were potting with. And so all of those opportunities began to emerge. And and for better or for worse, the pandemic became a gold mine of disrupted habits, right? And opportunities for new brands to emerge, um, to for, for new products to surface as a result of these new behaviors. Um, and 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 that, you know, it, it, it's, it's frightening for some brands, it's opportunistic for others. And I think, you know, we saw a lot of change as a result of that. You know, when we look at, at, at why people snack, right? I mean, there's a kind of top two, top two, it's really typically, it's like, you know, physiological or emotional, right? 81% is about, you know, said that, that they snack because, you know, they're, they're alleviating hunger and, and almost 50% snack because they're bored. Uh, you know, I think that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, but as we continue through this presentation, you're gonna see that those occasions are starting to evolve but also the functionality of the foods that we're eating within those conceits are, are beginning to um, uh, evolve as well. And I think that's really where some of the opportunities will exist that we'll talk about later. Um, and you know what became clear in looking at the data is that people have a complex relationship with snacking. Right. It's deeply human and, and full of emotions. Right. The fact that we eat because we're bored in and of itself says something about the, the, the zeitgeist of America. Uh, and at the extremes, it can be about indulgence. Right. And it can also be just about satisfying a basic human need like hunger. Um, but it, we're seeing that it's a lot more than that. Uh, and and when we asked kind of in, in pre-pandemic experience, what people most associated with snacking, joy, delight and excitement, you know, in that order are the words that came up. Right. And we'll talk about what words came up, you know, post pandemic and how they compare in a minute. But you can see it is very uh, emotional in, in its connection to a consumer. Then the pandemic. Right. Then the pandemic struck and 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 things kind of turned, you know, upside down, if you will. Right. Uh, you know, the uh, data from the USDA uh, tells us that, you know, out of home food expenditures drop by over 50 percent. Right. That's about thirty five billion dollars a month uh, that shifted. Uh, and that's a massive, a massive sea change. Uh, and then uh, and then if you look at just the behavior of like work and work from home, you know, obviously work from home skyrocketing. Uh, you know, the Economist reported the pre pandemic Americans spent, you know, about five percent of their time working from home and and. You know, during the pandemic spring of 2020, that figure had increased by a factor of 10 to roughly 60 percent of hours at work being spent at home. So obviously this has an impact on snacking. The question is, what is that impact? Right. And so if we start to think about like what the acceleration and deceleration in terms of, of trends that took place, as we saw, as it relates to kind of people's relationships with food and how they snack. Right. One big thing is clear, right? They're trying new things, right? The pandemic disrupted loyalty and behavior shopping patterns, right? We're either no longer in the grocery store and we're shopping online, or we're thinking about how we're spending our time very differently. Um, and 70% of consumers tried a new brand or product, right? And that could be because of certain products were out of stock, limited selection, pricing concerns, right? Or they're just, seeking something new, right? Because they're trying to break the monotony of their existence today based on uh, based on the pandemic impacting their lives. Um, so Eric, you know, if, if, if you think about kind of some of these behaviors, like maybe take us take us through the journey of, of you know, what else the data is telling us. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, in June, Avi and I presented this number as, as part of another presentation yeah. on how COVID was impacting shopping. Uh, so this is another Suzy New Hope survey. And one of the things that we found sort of mid-pandemic uh, summertime last year was that 65% of consumers reported that they are likely to buy healthier foods as a result of the impact of COVID-19. This is consistent. This is just one number, but it is consistent with a wide variety of other survey and sales data sort of data points that we we've seen over the past 12 months demonstrating that throughout the pandemic, consumers have expressed more concern about and put more effort into managing their health proactively. This trend existed long before COVID, and yet it is another example of what Avi talked about earlier of COVID as an accelerant to existing trends in the marketplace. Through 2020, grocery retail produce sales remain elevated even as out-of-home restaurant sales begin to normalize. So a few months after the beginning of the pandemic, that out-of-home number, that loss of $35 billion um, monthly of sales in restaurants that Avi talked about began to start climbing again. But one of the things that we see in sales data is that produce sales remained relatively strong even as sort of out of home spending began to increase in restaurants, uh, in, in restaurants. So this category produce, not typically known for strong growth numbers is suddenly benefiting. And it's one of those early signs of a shift towards home cooking, healthier eating, and maybe even an indication of healthier snacking habits developing among consumers. Combine this disruption in people's daily, li daily lives, the disruption to brand loyalty that happened as a result of people trying new things because of the out of stocks that Avi mentioned, or just being curious and wanting to try things, and add to that an increased mainstream concern about managing one's health during a pandemic, and we begin to see a shift in snacking as well. One such shift uh, that seems to have been a pivot away from on-the-go convenient snacking to somewhat healthier eating and snacking is illustrated by the numbers on this slide. Uh, these are uh, sales numbers through natural channels um, as provided by SPINs. Over the year, an entire, oh, sorry, over the years, um, pre-pandemic, an entire category grew up around the epitome, if you will, of convenient snacking on the go. That is the nutrition bars and gels category. According to the Nutrition Business Journal, in the U.S. alone in 2019, that category was worth about $5.7 billion. SPINS is showing us that uh, between 2019 and 2020, that that category alone Sales were down 20% between 2019 and 2020, right alongside decreases, 10% uh, decrease in sales of shelf-stable jerky and meat snacks, and then contrasted uh, by example, 20% increases over the same time period in produce sales and 34% increases in frozen fruits and vegetables. Not that I'm necessarily saying people are snacking exclusively on these things, but we're seeing here represented a shift away from convenient on the go and maybe some of the traditional salty snacks to a more healthy way of eating um, in the market. Consistent with this health trend and this idea of maybe uh, COVID being the accelerant for a lot of these health trends into the mainstream is Green Giant. Pictured in the back here in, in Times Square, early in May, uh, sorry, early in 2020, B&G, the owner of Green Giant brand, bought FarmWise, a natural and organic brand that was launched in 2014, that was kind of known for selling frozen foods, where they're hiding vegetables in, in their veggie fries and their veggie top products. Uh, what this was doing in many ways is, is G Green Giant is bringing the hidden veggie trend of making it easier for consumers to get more veggies into their diet into the mainstream more readily. And in some ways, this picture says so much about what's going on um, in consumers' lives right now. You know, look at this picture of Times Square, nearly empty, mid-pandemic Times Square with Green Giant in the background, marketing healthier hidden veggie freezer foods to a consumer with changing health goals and snacking needs at a moment when getting more veggies in your diet and healthier food in your diet is increasingly relevant and desirable to a larger group of consumers. So during the pandemic, what are people snacking on? What are their, fr what are their favorites? We showed you this data earlier. Salty and sweet are still consumers' favorite snacks. That hasn't changed. However, there is a preference uh, for healthy snacks that is increasing. We saw on the prior page that that healthy snack number was 22%. It's 27% now. What might be driving this? 
Maybe it's that people are at home more often, and as a result, they have greater access to their own refrigerators, their own food throughout the day. They have different snacking options than they used to have. Maybe it's the fear of the COVID-15 weight gain that people have been talking about, or maybe it is a proactive desire to better manage one's health, to boost their immunity, maybe as an insurance policy against COVID and its complications are beginning, or we believe are beginning to shape and reshape how consumers are snacking. Not completely, but on the margins or at the center, we're beginning to see this kind of change. Um, tell us about some of the yeah. subgroups that we looked at, Javi. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the biggest uh, our, our subgroup is is in particular like what we're calling kind of work from homers, right? They they are a, a dramatic change, right? Uh, probably you know the, the biggest change that we saw as a re, as it relates to uh, uh, COVID behavior is just people now working from home. Um, and that, you know, I think, you know, you mentioned before access to our refrigerators, you know, being able to just get up at any moment um, and 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 pick up, you know, a bite to eat or something to snack on, whether we're actually hungry or bored or both. Um, you know, the access uh, is is a, is different. Right. I just from my own personal experience. Right. You work in an office. You got to go to a shared kitchen to get some water. Maybe your your company is providing you with some snacks and those are limited here at home. You know, you've got your cupboard, you've got your pantry, you've got your refrigerator um, and you're deciding it's your choice what to stock those uh you know uh those items with um and 30 over 30 percent of work from homers um found their favorite snacks to be healthy right uh and and you know i think uh that just it goes in line with the trends that we've been talking just around people being a little bit more conscious about their health amidst the state of a pandemic um, and then you start to think about the psychological change, right? Many of us kind of entered, um, you know, this work from home, school from home uh, world, thinking it was going to be short term, right? Uh, I remember clearly thinking that like, oh, great, my daughter's going to be remote for a few weeks, and then we're going to go back to the real world. Um, we're going to, you know, be out of the office for a month or so. And we're going to reemerge. Everything is going to be just fine. You know, here we are over a year later, right? Still sitting in front of a webcam uh, and, and, and behaviors are completely different. And now we're having a different conversation, right? We're having a different conversation about like, what is the impact of staring at a webcam all day long? Um, not talking to people face to face. What, you know, is there mental health toll? Uh, loneliness, anxiety, stress as it relates to this new behavior. And as we talked about before, you know, snacking is emotional in, in many respects. And so those two things are very much tied together. Um, and when you start to look at this one class of work from homers, uh, you have to start to look at, 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 at those behavioral shifts. And is this paving a way for like increased conversation around self-care, taking care of you, you know, reducing stress. So those occasions and those things that we're looking to do with with our uh you know our behavior our snacking could be dramatically impacted by this kind of new trend and most companies now are thinking about a hybrid environment going forward and so you know this acceleration of work from home you know is probably going forward not going to be as dramatic but it's certainly not going to revert back to the way it was you know back in you know february of last year right we are we are going to live in a hybrid world going forward um, uh, and, and, and it's our jobs to understand how to navigate within that new conceit. Um, so it's no surprise, right? 25% uh, of work from homers became excited about energy improving snacks, right? I'm, I'm, it's midday. I'm getting tired. I've got zoom fatigue. I'm going back to back with, with meetings, right? I need to boost my energy. Um, I'm going to use a snack to do that. Uh, and, and I think it begins to tell the story of like, you know, functional, behavior, like functional foods, meaning how, how are, are, uh, are we getting a benefit out of what we're eating based on our state of mind and what we're trying to do in that moment? And I think that's a, uh, something really important to draw on. Uh, so if we zoom out, you know, kind of bird's eye view, right? Um, we've seen behavior, we've seen a lot of big changes to the, the snackers themselves, right? The people, but you know, generally speaking, hasn't changed too much in terms of, you know, snacking occasions pre, post, and during the pandemic. EV kind of went up a few points. Uh, snacking with others went down a few points. Uh, snacking in the office shifted to snacking at home. Um, but generally, you know, snacking, 97% of the country snacks, right? And 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 they always will be the case. Um, but so 
really the, the, the suggestion here is that there's a shift in the things that people are snacking on um, and what they're hoping to gain from those snacks, right? Lots of salty and sweet, but also a shift towards healthy, right? And then drum roll like what's the emotional connection to all of that uh so you know snacks work consistent constant you know i talked before about this idea that's like dial tone um it's the one thing that's reliable in our lives um we have snacks that we go to to make us feel a certain way uh you know i know when my daughter's feeling uh, a certain way she generally you know she she goes towards the ice cream like it, it's like we, we have things that make us feel comfortable in certain moments. Uh, and I think that reliability, that comfort um, is not going away. But the idea of, of, you know, how brands can connect emotionally to those specific occasions as they've evolved is really what we're talking about here. So during the pandemic, right, we talked before about pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, people look to snacks to make them, you know, feel joy, delight and a sense of calm. Right. And in that order, those were the words that they used. Um, and, and what's new here is that emotion of calm overtaking the emotion of excitement, which was during the pandemic. So people were looking for, you know, a sense of calm to relieve anxiety, to relieve stress, to get them out of that, you know, um, uh, psychological loop, if you will, of, of their daily routine. And, you know, that suggests that the emotional relationship of snacking shifted a bit to a place where peace of mind was a very important role, right, in snacking. So the big aha, right, not so big maybe, is people clung to snacks for, you know, a sense of normalcy. Uh, it was part of their routine. It was part of their day-to-day. -day. Um, it was a break from their Zooms. It was a break from their reality. Um, and, and, and with that, right, it gave them and, and hopefully gave them that sense of calm that they were really, like, hoping to gain. So where does that go tomorrow, right? Uh, you know, is, is the future bright? You know, what does snacking look like in the future? Where are we headed? That's kind of as we go into this next next section. Um, the reality is that, you know, snacking will continue to be an American pastime, uh, but snacks are going to need to work a little harder, right, to fulfill some of those different occasions, some of those different emotional states, right? Um, consumers are still going to engage in, you know, mindless and indulgent snacking. But the trend here is that, you know, people are, it appears that have been accelerated, the, the, the trend that's been accelerated by COVID is the trend towards more mindful, purposeful snacking, right? Snacks with intent, right? Snacks with a pur purpose. Uh, and I think, you know, as we go into the rest of this deck, you're going to see, you know, some of those come to life, right? Uh, along with this, maybe a desire for snacks to kind of fulfill a more set of complex emotions beyond just joy. <laughs> Right. We might be moving from excitement to comfort, uh, from from comfort to self-care. Right. These are all things that are on people's minds now as they emerge from a pandemic existence um, while still probably working from home quite a bit. Right. But also coming out of the apartments, out of their homes, out of their houses uh, and beginning to engage with other people. Right. Those those um, those functions are going to start to evolve. So the future is about snacks with benefits. Right. It's about a deeper connection to kind of consumers goals and their desire for specific outcomes. Right. I talked about this idea of snacks with a purpose kind of, you know, talking yesterday with, with Eric, it, it dawned on me. It's like kind of what happened with 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 beverages. Right. There's like a drink for everything, a drink to help you focus, a drink to give you energy, a drink to help you sleep better. Right. Or to improve your health. Uh, and, and the same thing is now happening, happening with snacks. It's like, you know, so snacks with benefits, snacks with intent, snacks with purpose is where we see the future going. And Eric's going to give you some examples of that and, 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 uh, and bring that to life. Yeah, Avi, I love that idea of snacks having to work harder, right? And, and I think that's part of what it is, is uh, snacking has always been a, a really complex human thing, right? It, it's it's getting our meal, but it's also this different thing, and it plays this emotional role and this functional role. And, and I think we need to think about snacking maybe much more broadly. Yes, a bag of carrots can be a snack, right? It might not necessarily be designed or sold as a snack product, but for many consumers, they're engaging with it in that way. And, and and they might also be engaging with a bag of potato chips that way. We need to think really broadly about how do we serve consumers' desire to snack, especially since so many consumers seem to be replacing traditional meals with more frequent snacking throughout the day. Um, and there is just this complex emotional and functional uh, role that snacks play. So 
Snacks with benefits. Let's talk about some of those. You know, uh, this is big. One of the really interesting things is we showed in our survey consumers six different innovative, healthy snack food ideas, things like collagen enhanced cookies and probiotic cheeses and kombucha granolas and beet ice creams. And what we found was 77% of people were interested in trying one or more of those six product ideas, right? So people are interested in experimenting with different things, especially if we're positioning them in this snacks with benefits sort of way. One example of this is peekaboo ice cream. Um, it's advertised in exactly this manner. Peekaboo ice cream is ice cream with benefits uh, with one serving of hidden veggies in every pint sized container. It is perfectly positioned at that paradoxical intersection of ice cream and vegetables at, at the paradoxical intersection of indulgent and health minded snacking. I'm not necessarily saying this product is healthy, but does it allow somebody to potentially see this as a snack because it's got beets in it um, as opposed to just an indulgent treat? It's beginning to play that role of with benefits for consumers. We also see in the data that a third of consumers want health indulgent snacks and over a quarter want snacks that maybe offer an energy benefit. Core, uh, core bars, energy bars fulfill that promise, the promise that energy bars have typically promised with a mix of carbs and protein. Core's gone one step further and said, hey, let's actually functionalize an energy bar and deliver you some real energy with caffeine. Then they went one step further, further beyond just delivering energy uh, by delivering the feel good digestive promise of probiotics. Hoplark Hop Tea, uh, this particular version of their product is a chamomile and hop based sort of the calm one position product, is responding to a lot of what we're seeing in the marketplace right now, which is this seesaw of modern consumers' lives, right? On the opposite side of energy is the need for sleep. Um, and when we look at snackers, stress, and caffeine fueled lives, there's a need for products that also help people energize by meeting their demand for calm, re-energization through relaxation and sleep, right? We see as well, 35% of consumers, this is mass market consumers, again, are asking for uh, products with no additives. 32% want sugar-free options. So in the world of snacking, we have products like Select Harvest and Nick's Swedish Ice Cream here. Um, Select Harvest is using a monk fruit, uh, non-caloric but natural, uh, sweetener to sweeten their maple monk crunch uh, almonds and other nut products. And Nix, while not necessarily a clean label product, is doing a lot of really creative formulation with non-caloric sweeteners to deliver, again, an indulgent product without the guilt uh, that a lot of other products may have, whether that's coming from the guilt of eating sugar or just the association with, with ice cream as a snack or an indulgent treat. About a quarter of snackers are also seeking snacks with natural sugars, not necessarily no sugar, but maybe less or more natural oriented sugars and or high proteins. And so again, when we're talking about functionalizing, meeting the needs of today's snacker, um, we have an example of Blissfully Better, who's responding uh, with their delightful sort of caramel, toffee, chocolate products. Uh, these are vegan, organic, non-GMO and they're being made without refined sugars and only with its six ingredients. So they're hitting that kind of clean label, better for you, you know, maybe the purposeful, maybe the benefits here is I feel like I'm snacking in a way that's more responsible because it's vegan and because it's organic. On the protein side of things, we have Quavos here offering guilt-free salty snacking with a keto-friendly, high-protein, low-carb chip that they've formulated using egg whites as their core foundation. So again, uh, guilt-free salty snacking because you're getting a high-protein content in this particular example. So one way to think about the future of snacking is purposeful and self-care oriented we ask snackers why they're interested in trying some of the innovative products that we showed up on that first page um, and snackers said that they're excited to try these these self-care health oriented snacks with benefit products because they offer an opportunity to snack without guilt so again please don't forget the emotional side of snacking and the importance of helping people feel like they can have this snack they can have this convenience and they're getting some benefit as well they're avoiding guilt they're getting some health whatever it might be we also saw uh, that during the pandemic, consumers wanted variety. They needed a break from monotony. They wanted that consistency, that sense of comfort that comes from snacking. 
if you're working at home all day, snacks are an easy way to break up your day, stand up from your desk, do something, right? And so for a lot of consumers as well, they were saying they were interested in these products in part because of novelty seeking and experimentation, bringing a little bit of variety back in people's lives where a lot of that variety and that experimentation of being out of the home and engaging with the world like we used to uh, might not be as, as easy to come by. With that, Avi, take us home with a couple uh, of our last insights and yeah. summary. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think at the end of the day, we've, we we believe the emerging you know opportunity for snack brands is is to just get creative, to consider kind of this shift towards functional, purposeful, intent-driven snacking with benefits, right? And and to explore kind of as we saw in, in the examples that that Eric just walked through, you know, unique ways to innovate at the intersection of occasions, need states, and consumer goals. What are consumers trying to do? What are they hoping to achieve? Where are they doing those activities? And 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 how can you intersect, you know, the those those um, those moments? Looking beyond the obvious, you know, not just snacking on the go with friends, but you know, snacking to relieve stress or snacking before sleep, uh, snacking after a run, uh, snacking for mental energy. You know, it goes on and on and on to think about all the various need states where you can find some white space um, to begin to enter the feed, right? The the day to day feed of, of of what happens in a person's life. You know, that that that's my myself as an individual. It's myself as a parent buying snacks for my child. Like there are a lot of different moments in time um, that, that, that are opportunities for brands to begin to tell really compelling stories based on their unique value and their unique selling propositions and begin to innovate and create new products, right? That, that, can, that can meet those new um, occasions and those new demands. Right. So, you know, kind of to to bring the, uh, you know, the, the, the plane in for a landing here. Right. A few just general things to keep in mind. You know, consumers are snacking as much as they've ever snacked. Right. You know, it's the the, the, the habits have changed. The occasions have changed. Our behaviors have changed. But it's still dial tone. Right. It's still something that everybody does. Uh, and, and, and for different reasons that are typically, you know, um, physiological or emotional, uh, and, and, and snacks continue to bring feelings of joy and comfort, right? Um, it's part of how we release some energy and stress, uh, in our lives. And, and lastly, the, the desire for healthy snacks continues to rise, right? Um, consumers want more variety in their choices and brands need to do both, in, you know, be innovative and health conscious in, in the snacks that they offer. Um, We'll make sure that, you know, at, at the end of this webinar that everyone gets the follow-up email with a link to the deck uh, so that you have access to the data. Um, and and hopefully now we have some time to answer some questions and banter a little bit. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, it, it, it certainly for me, uh, this was a fun this was a fun narrative to tell uh, because, A, I'm excited to kind of reemerge into the world uh, and, and I'm excited for some of these new occasions myself. Um, and I'm excited to try some of these new incredible products that hopefully will begin to, you know, give me the benefits that I'm seeking in those moments. Uh, so Eric, thanks so much. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's take some questions and, you know, if you have any final closing thoughts too, uh, you know, br bring us home. Yeah, no, I, uh, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm anxious to get into some of the questions you were speaking and I was kind of getting a chance to, to preview some of them. I yeah. think there's a, a few good ones here. So let's just dive into those. Um, do you want me uh, to pick one since you're probably, what's, what's one yeah, pick one. What's, what's one that jumped out at you? Yeah. One of the first ones that I read, um, was, you know, just had to do with this idea of with healthy snacks, having such a different meaning for, from consumer to consumer, are there ways to develop scalable solutions in this space as opposed to small niche products? Um, so, you know, really interesting question uh, there. And I, I think that that's a, a really fair challenge, you know, especially as a, a maybe a larger organization looking for that idea of scale. It is tough to predict what the next big scaled health idea is going to be. Um, I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but but one of the thoughts that has run through my mind over the last year or two is, is, is there an opportunity for a larger organization to build a brand uh, at a platform level that is about um, health and wellness, but offers up a whole variety of different ways of getting there. So it's not just launching a new vegan product or a gluten-free product or, you know, an enhanced coffee, but instead about really 
almost building snacking with benefit as a, as a platform and having a variety of different products and claim sets across their products that uh, create an opportunity to, again, build a brand that is bigger than any one of these sort of niches. So that, that was kind of my top of mind idea of, of course, everyone's yeah. going to look for the next big thing. Uh, but I also think that we don't see enough innovation around how do I look beyond the niche consumer who wants this idea to stitch together niche consumers into a larger group uh, serving a, a, a more scaled scaled opportunity in the market. That's my thought on that. I don't I think know that, if you've got anything. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really great point. Uh, and, and Jared, thanks for asking that question. I think, you know, my, my, my partner, Matt Britton, likes to say that, you know, niche is the new norm. Uh, and, and I think that's entirely right. And I think your, your point is, is, is very well stated that, like, if you, if you can aggregate the niche into something bigger and, and, and connect people, you know, we did a, a webinar recently all around kind of brand love. And, and that was one key takeaway is, like, how, how do you turn – you know, your consumers into advocates and fanatics and, and, and get other people who experience or, or are part of that same niche to come along for that journey. And I think it's a really important point because, because, you know, it goes right into this next question that I was going to uh, uh, take from Karen uh, snacks with benefits feels very close to better for you snacks. How are these two concepts different? Um, and I think this ties together with kind of this idea of niche, right? Um, it's not just about better for you. That's one benefit. That's one way that a snack can work better for you. But, you know, if, I, if, if I'm, you know, looking to get energy, maybe at, at that moment, you know, it might not be that great for me, but I want something that's going to give me a boost. Um, if I'm about to go for a run, uh, if I want to go to sleep at night and sleep better, like there are, are different like need states moments in my day that are not just about me being healthy or me being better, but it's about me wanting to achieve something or do something or be with other people in a certain environment. And so, you know, I th think understanding those needs where you can either enter that conversation or frankly, add value to that moment, um, I think that's where the opportunity lies. So it's, it's, it's bigger and broader than just better for you. It's really like, you know, what is the specific value prop that you can bring to a consumer as they're experiencing their routine in that moment? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree uh, in, yeah. entirely on that. And the only other thing I would add is, you know, part of what you mentioned is it's the possibility of functionalizing. I think of better for you right. as improving upon something, you know, replacing an ingredient that's out in consumer's mind in terms of what's healthy or, you know, creating something that is genuinely better for you. And then there's also this idea of functionalizing something, you know, as we saw, um, people have done a lot of experimentation with adding probiotics. I'm not necessarily saying that's the way to go, but, you know, like Corbar did with, you know, with caffeine and probiotics in it, a little bit of that can also go uh, a long way in terms of communicating something to somebody about what the benefit is to them. That could actually take us to Sarah's question about claims and, you know, how do you resonate with consumers without being sensational? The, the concern that she brought up is about, you know, how can you make a claim without some of the legal challenges and, and our company stretching it and how do you again, you know, resonate without being sensational? I think the way to do that is to trust that we have a more conscious, aware, engaged consumer, not everybody, um, but leading with leading with product ingredients is very often the way in which people get to that, you know, is by formulating with, you know, turmeric um, allows an engaged and curious consumer to understand, OK, well, why is turmeric in there? Oh, OK, I'll find on my own that maybe there's some anti-inflammatory benefits and there's some marketing about that product that is suggesting that without kind of coming out right out and saying it. I, I think that. For a lot of brands now, it's it's not as overt as we might like to be, but it also avoids being legally, you know, in a in a in a risky area. And so, I think one way of getting there again is is through very overt ingredient formulation, um, but also potentially just in marketing and targeting certain consumer audiences who you believe are going to understand the inherent benefits and the inherent use of the product that you're selling. Um, so those are the targeting and, and select ingredient is kind of how I'm thinking about some of that. I love that. So I'll, I'll, I'll put another question on you from, from Santiago, which kind of um, uh, leans into this idea of your ingre ingredients. Is, do you think consumers are interested in traceability, meaning knowing where the ingredients used come from? 
Um, I would naturally answer that question of yes, but I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts based on, on what you just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, an increasingly important one. I think it is, as is so much of the world of sustainability or responsible business, it is a difficult thing to market. So often what I say is, yes, I think consumers are interested in it, but engage in that activity for a couple of different reasons and not necessarily because it's the first thing you're going to say at the top of your marketing communication priority list, right? People are probably not going to buy or try your product for the very first time exclusively because you have a great traceability story and you can talk very, you know, intelligently about how and comprehensively about how your products are sourced and where it's coming from. I do think that sustainability and responsible business practices and the kind of traceability and sourcing is really important in building long-term relationships with people. It's about getting repeat purchase. It's about getting recommendations and referrals. It's about engaging the heart and the mind of the consumer beyond the the taste buds or that initial need state that may have driven them to try the product in the first place. So yeah. get the trial based on the uniqueness of the product and the killer flavor, and then win them uh, long-term with that story of, of traceability. I love that. And so, so P Paige is asking, um, you know, do you see specific snacking trends for women versus men, various age ranges, et cetera? How important is it to focus on a specific audience? Uh, I'll let I'll let I'll let Eric talk a, lot, a little bit about specifically in the in the in the um, food space. I would just tell you, as someone who's more of a broader consumer insights focus across all industries, the answer to that is unequivocally yes. Like you have to always focus on a specific audience. You have to know who you're talking to. You have to understand what's important to them and put the consumer at the center of every decision that you're making. And I think as we're seeing, you know, as we talked about uh, throughout this webinar, this idea of, you know, uh, functional or, or specific need states, you know, women versus men, uh, kids of different ages, they're all going to have different need states. I know for myself, at the end of the day, when I'm closing down the Zoom, I'm wired. I want to calm down. At the beginning of the day, I may want something to give me a boost of energy. My daughter has a very different arc over her day, right? My wife has a very different arc over her day. And we all have very different, we vibrate at very different levels throughout the day. And we're all looking for different moments in time for us to do different things. We all work out at different times. We exercise at different times. And I think the idea of like, w whether it's food or any industry, frankly, the idea of focusing on a specific audience is just a, a almost a mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent. And I would say the same thing about other sort of, you know, you, you've mentioned it before, but niches, uh, what did you say? Niches is yeah. the new Niche is the new norm. Yeah. Niche is the new norm. I've said the same thing for a long time, very indirectly about, you know, consumer food tribes and different things like that, right? You know, I think the way to understand a customer's need is to get as tightly defined a design target as you can get in the marketplace. And sometimes that might mean looking at an audience that is unmarketable, too small you know, not appealing to a large organization. That might be looking at vegans for the 3% of the population that they are, not because you're going to sell exclusively or market exclusively to vegans. Same thing. It may or may not make sense to build a brand targeting marketing directly to women. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that just feels like you're pandering to, to gender things. I remember companies back yeah. in the in the early 2000s who had thought they had to have pink credit cards just for women with, you know, a very... Anyways, I'm not saying, I think there's a big distinction between design target and marketing. And I always advocate for getting the tightest design target as you can, because it is that really tight, well-focused audience that's going to be able to tell you really clearly what pain they experience and what problems they have that you can help solve. Then the goal is to say, who are all the people who have that same need? How big is that audience? Now that I've identified a really clear need that I can design against, how many other people have it? Odds are it's not just that teeny percent of people who have that and that there is a bigger audience. And then you can then market to the need that you found by target, talking to this tightly defined design target. So a hundred percent with you. On yeah, that I think, I think, yeah, I think that's super insightful, you know, and, and, and understanding, frankly, you know, from a marketing standpoint, who the key influencers are within each of those, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, audiences and and how they're moving the needle you know i always i always use my daughter as a pulse check on on where the world is going and just seeing her behavior and how it's shaped and influenced through 
something as simple as TikTok, right? TikTok is influencing the snacks that she's making at home and the things that she wants to like engage with. Um, and, and I think all of that is really important. It's a holistic view of the consumer uh, and, 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 what, and, 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 and what are the things that make them tick um, at different ages, at different stages, different genders, different passion points, all of that, um, you know, really painting a, a true view of your consumer. That's what Eric and I do for a living. It's like understanding consumer behavior um, is, is why we have jobs. And, and obviously, you know, it's a big part of, of going to market uh, is understanding, you know, all those different pain points. Um, yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, Stacy, this is a fun one. Uh, I was going to skip over it, but I think it's 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 actually very relevant. Uh, Stacy uh, asks, with all seriousness, as more states legalize recreational cannabis, how do you think snack trends will shift? Um, I'll let you take that <laughs> first, Eric, and then I'll jump in. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a fun question, so why not? It is a fun uh, question. It's, just, it's, it's yet another it's yet another behavior change, right? So now you know. We, we have a drink at the end of the day, you know, peanuts and beer go together, whatever, like things will start to emerge, you know, when, when people start to, uh, you know, um, leverage cannabis recreationally, I'm sure it will start to have an impact on snacking in some way, shape or form. Uh, you know, let me, let me know your thoughts and then I'll jump in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually that's interesting. Um, as, as new hope, um, we have not done a lot of studying of the cannabis space, uh, just, just as a, a principle of how we've decided to define what is a food beverage or supplement and what's on our show floor. So it's not a space I've studied a whole lot. It, it is, it is a fascinating one. Avi, just tell me more about what you're seeing in that space. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about the space specifically. All I can, all I can say is, is, you know, there are going to be people who are going to emerge, you know, with this new behavior. Uh, and, and the question is, you know, are those people going to want healthier snacks to munch on? You know, what is the behavior that's going to come out of it? Um, I think it's fascinating, you know, just the connection between the word munchies and cannabis, like just generally <laughs> brings up snacking. So uh, it's the reason why I pulled this question out. Uh, yeah. I thought it was, uh, is, you know, I, I have, a, I have to imagine that, it will have some impact, uh, and and you know I um, a, a, a good friend of mine is the founder of uh, Insomnia Cookies. Uh, Insomnia Cookies founded you know uh, on on a college campus very specifically to tackle this one problem state or need state right yeah. is like late night munchies and that is a monster monster business uh, you know delivering cookies to your door inside of an hour uh, you know at midnight. So I have to believe that that certain trends will begin to emerge. Uh, I don't have the data to support it. It's all <laughs> anecdotal. And, uh, uh, you know, but I, I go back to the last to... question, which is behavior. <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, what's making just riffing on this one, um, system yeah. one, system two thinking is coming to mind to me. Like in that state, where is your implicit habit? Like what are the closest associations that require the least amount of deliberate thought? And that might be a really great, uh, I am not suggesting this as a research methodology, but if you want to get to system <laughs> one behavior, maybe you do just see how people behave in that mental mind state and, and what snack they yeah. choose. <laughs> in yeah. that moment yeah it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's funny um uh yvonne asking uh do you see immunity as an interesting ingredient to use with snacks uh what are your what are your thoughts on that one yeah, immunity is uh, immunity is a, obviously a relevant topic um the nutrition business journal team here at new hope has done on a lot of work in that space. Uh, we didn't look a ton at snacking, but there is some innovation in that space. We're seeing, you know, places that have, I think, permission to go to immunity are doing really well in that space. Space. Think gummy vitamins where it's easy to go there. Gummies kind of play a snacky like role for people. Clearly, they're not filling up on them, but they do kind of have that emotional benefit of, you know, eat one or two of these when you're feeling snacky and you're getting, you know, a benefit. We're seeing um, Matt's organic orange juice that's launching an elderberry enhanced sort of vitamin C and zinc enhanced orange juice product where they have permission to go deeper into immunity than a, in an orange juice already was. I think immunity is going to resonate with consumers. It is a very tricky thing going back to the, the conversation about what you can say and what claims you can make. I think it's yeah. a really tricky place to go from a legal claim standpoint. And so I, I think that, yes, uh, immunity can be done, but you might have to be 
heavy through the ingredient? You know, do you, do you feel like you've got a functional mushroom play that you can make where people will understand that's an immunity claim? Go there, do that. We've seen that being an interesting sort of multifunctional ingredient to add to snacks. We've seen people do, you know, vitamin C and other sorts of things where it's easy for people to get there. But I would be very cautious about coming right out, especially right now with an overt immunity claim, unless there's yeah. science and formulation behind it. Look at what's being done in the supplement space, maybe for some of the what to do and what not to do in the market on that. It's a tricky one, but a compelling yeah. one for consumers right now. Yeah, I think I think it's a super, super uh, a, a good point that like you don't want to overpromise here, right? In a world where people are debating the efficacy of vaccines and thinking about how they're going to reemerge from 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 this pandemic, um, it's a very, very fine line. Uh, so K Kayla a asked a, a, a question, and I'm going to throw your way. Um, I don't know if you have data uh, on this particular topic, but why do you believe the nutrition bar category is down during the pandemic? Are they seen too much as on the go and nobody was going anywhere? Uh, many offer uh, that energy boost benefit people want. So is the problem due to the occasion they were traditionally marketed for? Um, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I, I would think, you know, from my own behavior that the nutrition bar is almost like a meal replacement for me sometimes. Uh, and I don't know if I need to replace meals because, you know, the fridge is right here. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if you guys have any data or any thoughts, uh, uh, if you specifically have any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I don't have any hard data on it. Anecdotal evidence, I think it is that it's not that the bar itself is less relevant. I think it is the occasion. I think it is the channel, right? A lot of bars were sold through um, through convenience stores as one-off items. A lot of them are being sold near the cash register or somebody's picking up one out of the box as opposed to bringing a box home. People are eating them coming to and from the gym. You know, they're in the purse, they're in the car, they're that thing that you're you know, snacking between things when you are on the go. And, and so many of those occasions, as well as those store visits, um, the number of times you're at the gym, buying a bar, you know, all of that has kind of been diminished. It's not disappeared, um, but you lost a lot of small occasions. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a, it's not a death by a thousand cuts, but it's a lot of small incremental things as opposed to one big dramatic shift of people no longer seeing it as healthy or no longer seeing it as a good product. Um, I expect right. sales will come back in that space. Um, but we have seen a shift, you know, in the on the go convenience space. And I do think that there will be some persistence to that over time. There will be more people who stay at home, work at home, work at in the office less often. And, and so I, I think that set is challenged a little bit. Um, as are similar eating occasions. They won't, they, they will come back, but how much would be the question in my mind? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, Jeremiah is asking, uh, do you think these thoughts for the future apply across all income brackets or particularly just to the folks who are able to work from home? Um, you know, I, 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 just to go back to the data, right? You know, the, the, the folks that we asked, census weighted across age, income, et cetera. So I would argue that um, it's across the board, obviously work from home skews in a certain, uh, in a certain way. Uh, but I, I, think, I think generally speaking, if you look at 97% of America snacking, um, you know, price points of various snacks, I think probably would have an impact. But generally speaking, I think the, the occasions are, are all evolving. I don't know, Eric, if you have thoughts on that particular question. Yeah, I, I don't think income is the, the defining factor here. I think it's lifestyle choice. I think it's what priorities people have in their lives. I, I remember this as one example of this is, you know, back when back when we used to fly and take cabs places, you know, so I guess this was, was a little while back um, that it was not an Uber, but it was an actual cab. Um, I remember talking to the cabbie. I often will just start food conversations with people since that's my line of work. And and I remember talking <laughs> to this one cabbie who had, you know, was an EMT. He was driving cab a little extra and off hours to to make some extra money. This was not a guy who who was making, you know, uh, the average income. He was, you know, he's you know, definitely also not somebody who necessarily prioritized health. You know, his car smoked, smelt like cigarette smoke. You know, yeah. it was just clear from appearance that maybe health was not his top priority. But we had the most interesting conversation about how far out of the way and how much of a premium he was willing to pay for organic, humanely raised beef because that was something that he chose that was important to him. And regardless of income, it was the value set and the beliefs and the behaviors and where he was willing to invest himself that it defined how he engaged in the natural products community. 
I think the same is generally to say here is some people don't have time for this. Others do. It's less about income. It's more about values and priorities and how people choose to organize their lives. I couldn't agree more. So we are we are at uh, 59 minutes and 30 seconds here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I think we'll, uh, we'll you know, and, and there's a queue a mile long of questions. So got, like everybody at at, at at home, um, you know, thank you for, for your engagement here. Uh, really, we could go for, for a long time. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Eric, as always, man, uh, you know, love doing these webinars with you. Um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have more, more to come and everyone at home look out for your next invite because, uh, you know, we're going to try to do this uh, as often as we can. Any final thoughts, uh, Eric, as we kind of, you know, wrap it up here? Yeah, just one little logistics thing uh, for all of you who are here. You'll also get an email with a link um, before too long here so that you can reaccess this content. And, and I think the deck will probably be available as well. Um, yeah, no, just thanks for joining us. Thanks for, for being engaged in this space. And I'm really excited to continue the conversation. And Avi, likewise, this is always so much fun. It's, uh, it's almost more of a podcast than a webinar. We'll, we'll just keep doing it. I know, right? I love it. Awesome. Well, listen, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, you know, everyone at home, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, hopefully we'll all be returning back to some semblance of normalcy, whatever that new normal, the new, new normal uh, becomes. Uh, and until then, you know, enjoy your snacks, um, make them functional and, and, and with yeah. benefits. And, uh, and until next time, uh, I'm Avi Savar. And, and, and on behalf of myself and Eric, really, thank you so much for joining us today. We had such a good time and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks Avi. Bye.